and thank you to everyone at uh, BEMA for organizing this event. Um, I'll just briefly explain what we're going to be covering in the next two sessions, um, and then I'll just uh, say a tiny bit about my experience so far of radiology, and then we'll just get straight into the first session. So today is sort of the introductory uh, talk where we'll look at the basic uh, types of fractures um, and hopefully by the end we'll be able to describe the different types of fractures that you will come across. Um, I'll also give you a couple of classification systems that you can use um, and we will finish by doing some anatomy and we'll go over basically the most common parts of the body that you need to know for MSK radiology. Um, it can get quite complicated, some of the bones and parts of the bones that uh, you won't necessarily need to know for your stage, but we'll keep things simple. Um, and I'll ask a few harder questions as well for anyone that wants to try and uh, get the answers. And I will uh, be asking sort of uh, you to participate if you're happy to type uh, in the chat. Um, when I ask questions, I'll, I'll point at some anatomy and just uh, type uh, your answer. And it's good to try and commit to an answer because um, if you get it right, then that's great. And if you get it wrong, then don't worry. It's actually a way to learn. And you'll probably remember that case better if you committed to an answer. Uh, tomorrow is then probably the more fun uh, side of the series when we'll actually go through some cases. So I've got uh, 10 cases, we'll just go straight into them tomorrow and they will be uh, real cases uh, from real life patients that have been in my reporting silo from the past two or three months. Um, so they're all sort of real cases, probably the most common things that we would see quite often and they're all from my reporting pile and I'll get you to see if you can spot the fractures. Um, but really sort of the build up to being able to do the cases is to just have the basic uh, grasp of the, how to describe what kind of fracture you're seeing and which part of the body uh, it's in. And if you can be any more specific than that, then that's great. But uh, the basics are always a great place to start. And uh, if you describe something, uh, even if it's simple, uh, as long as sort of you can say where it is uh, and which part of the body, uh, maybe something about it that uh, maybe the doctor on the phone will be understand uh, what, what you're saying really without looking at the image. That's kind of what we're going to try and get you to do by the end of the series. Uh, so let's just go to the next slide. I'll just briefly uh, thank you to Ria for introducing me, but that's just... Uh, just, just to say that uh, special hello to anyone at Imperial College. I enjoyed my time there. And uh, it's it, you don't do a lot of radiology at medical school. Certainly from, from my case at Imperial, I think we only did about a week and a half, uh, which obviously is not a lot to work out if you're interested in the specialty or not. But what I would say is that uh, I will put my email address out at the end of the series. If anyone wants to message me, about sort of applying to radiology. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you had. Um, if there's any sort of keen interest in that, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I did a, a month elective in radiology at Johns Hopkins. So some of the content um, that I'll be going through in this series uh, will be from there. And I think I found it useful to have another sort of perspective on how to report fractures and how to look at MSK films. So some of the content will be from there. Uh, my foundation was in, was in the South Thames, but I'm now uh, down in Plymouth. And uh, the hospital Dereford that I'm at is quite a big sort of trauma center. Uh, so we do see some pretty interesting cases uh, coming through. These sort of 10 commandments of radiology, um, it's not, they're not for you to learn sort of off the top of your uh, head. They're really just uh, something I learned from, from Hopkins. And they, um, the, a professor there called Donna Magid, she came up with these, uh, these commandments. And some of them are sort of more useful than others. But really, there's some, some of the basics in here are some of the things that sort of uh, you'll need for your whole radiology career, because they are 
sort of fundamentals that will get you through medical school foundation, even through radiology training, uh, especially a couple of these points are extremely important. So the first one just localize with one finger. Um, really, that's more for the radiographers to kind of tell you in the history, uh, actually where the specific point of injury was. Um, because if you get through a film that uh, says you've got someone with let's say pain in the distal, uh, the distal phalanx of one of the second or third fingers or something like that. And then you see some strange kind of periosteal reaction or something in a different part of a bone or even the other side. Uh, you might question what you're looking at and the age of something you're looking at because obviously people have, have newer fractures, have older fractures. So if you get a good history that says, somebody fell on the outstretched hand and then you have a fracture in that location or what you think is a fracture but it's in the exact right location and you can see some changes then that's going to make it you, you much more confident to put down in your report um, that what you're saying is an acute fracture uh, also this is for obviously for sort of plain for mammoth k but in ultrasound that's really important because when you've got the patient in front of you um and you're scanning let's say their abdomen if they they're telling you with their one finger that they're painful in for example the right iliac fossa then you can think about maybe appendicitis if it's a young patient or it fits with that kind of history so um the localize with one finger that's number one uh, for a reason. So I've got a question here from Charmaine what's the difference between radi radiograph and x-ray? Um, that's an excellent question, and I'll tell you now that people in even in foundation and above will still get this wrong. Uh, so that is number 10. Um, that's the rule number 10, uh, and I'll just cover that now whilst, whilst we've got the, the, uh, the question up here. An x-ray, uh, some people will, will throw that around and say, I've got a chest x-ray, I've got an abdominal x-ray for you to look at. What they really mean is they've got a chest radiograph, which means that they've got a plain film. So a radiograph is just a film that's used x-rays to get the, uh, the image. Now, you'll sound a lot clever if I think you use the term chest radiograph or ankle radiograph, because an x-ray in itself is just it's just a photon uh, to get into the physics. I won't, I won't bore you with that, but an X-ray is an invisible uh, beam of energy. So what you really are saying is that you're looking at an image. Uh, so I, me and my colleagues, we don't say, we don't say sort of chest X-ray because you can't see an X-ray. So really you, you want to say chest radiograph because that's the image that you can see. So that's a great question. Um, number two, cone and center. Some of that's to do with physics because you don't want to give patients radiation on places that you're not interested in. But essentially what that just means is if someone comes in with a painful knee, you want to make sure that you get the, the knee in the center of the image. And then that's your sort of primary focus. Um, occasionally you can have, you may have to send back a patient if they, for example, uh, had foot pain and they only gave you the ankle, uh, but actually their pain is lower down in the foot. So that's number two. I would say number three is the most important rule. Whenever you get shown an image, uh, a radiograph, um, you will, you should say it, it will, it's my normal practice to look at the orthogonal view. What I mean by that is if you have a frontal sort of ankle, um, so you're looking at it front on, you want to see a lateral view as well. So you need to see a view that's either 90 degrees or at a different angle to your first view, because believe me that there are so many examples of places where someone has a fracture that's only seen from one angle. Uh, I may even have one tomorrow. So that is a little, uh, little disclaimer there, but um, you know, some fractures can be hidden around the back or around the side of a bone. 
Um, so one view is no view. Always, you always need two views at least. Sometimes we do more than two. Uh, show you late uh, tomorrow. Uh, for example, when we image the scaphoid, which is a bone sort of in the in the anatomical snuff box, a very important bone. We do four views of that bone because it can be very hard to see the fractures, and uh, you need to have uh, four different angles of it. <clears throat> Number four, clinician communicate with the radiologist and technologist. And technologist, that's just really meaning that uh, the medical history is very important. So if you've got someone with, uh, let's say, a cancer, or they've got bony metastases, <clears throat> you really want to know whether uh you know the the part of the the body you're looking at already had metastases there you might be worried about a pathological fracture or whether they'd injured uh that ankle before for example like as they might tell you had they have a previous injury on that site so the clinical history is extremely important and medical history number five um as i alluded to earlier really what I'll try and get you to do by the end of this is just to describe what you're seeing first. I don't even necessarily need you to know what it is, um, but it's really to try and get you to say, for example, I can see a transverse lucent line across the distal phalanx of the second finger. Now, I'm not saying you'll be able to get all those words in, in a succinct sentence, but in medicine, as you as you sort of see as you go up the ladder, uh, you're always going to have a senior maybe on the end of the phone. And for example, for me, when I'm on call, I won't always be able to tell what's going on. So if I'm reporting a CT and I need the help of my consultant, <clears throat> they might not have the images to hand uh, if they don't have a workstation. For example, if they're at home and they uh, they haven't got their their desk there. I just need to be able to describe what I can see. I can see some periosteal reaction around this bone. Uh, <clears throat> I can also see X, Y, and Z. Um, I don't know what it is. And if I've described it well enough, hopefully the consultant will be able to uh, have an idea of what actually it is. So the better you can describe, uh, sort of the better you're going to be because uh, we're not always going to know the answers or the differentials, but just being able to describe, describe it is a great way to start in radiology. Uh, number six is be veritable witnesses. Um, that's really just saying that if you haven't got an adequate radiograph, be careful about reporting uh, sort of definite no's. So if you have, and we'll discuss this maybe later on today about uh, technical qualities of the film, but if, if something's not technically adequate enough for you to see the film properly, uh, just be careful about saying no definite fracture there. Uh, they may have to get re-imaged. Number seven, this is really about, well, in medicine, as you probably know already, there's lots of sort of eponymous names we're trying to come away from that uh, in medicine in general. In radiology, there are still some terms that you'll hear banded around like Colley's fracture. Uh, there's Montegia fracture, Galeazzi fractures. These are all sort of named after, I guess, the, the doctors that first described them. But I think it's better to not just learn the eponymous names, but to learn, uh, for example, the pattern of distal radial fracture with associated ulna. Uh, dislocation or something, whatever it is. If you know the names as well, uh, that's great. But it's better just to learn sort of what you're actually describing because I think these names will go out of fashion at some point. Number eight is treat the patient, not the radiograph. Some radiographs can look a lot worse than the patient sounds and vice versa. Uh, 10 to 14 days, we can always repeat a film if we're not sure uh, about the fracture. Um, so that's a good time. After 10 to 14 days, you'll start to see some periosteal reaction uh, if you did have a fracture, for example, in that site. Number nine, lend no foothold to liars. This is, a, this is controversial in radiology, sort of. We, we want to give a good report that answers the question and helps the clinicians. So we don't want to sit on the fence if we can, but it's still good practice to say 
if you can't, if you're not sure about something to say, this cannot be excluded, for example, or clinical correlation needed. Uh, and number 10, we went through uh, thanks to the question. So let's go on and actually start to describe the types of fractures. So as you can see, there's lots of different kinds. Um, you don't need to learn all of these, um, but hopefully you'll be able to remember a couple of them. And uh, if you're sort of a first or second year, uh, maybe some of the ones from the top line would be great for you to remember. If you're more of a sort of third, fourth year, uh, maybe try and learn a few more. But fractures don't always uh, sort of fits exactly into this model um, of one pattern but uh, often they do. So if, you, if they do sort of, you think obviously fit into the pattern, then it is worth describing sort of uh, the pattern that you think it is. Um, so A, that's just a transverse fracture. So we've got a bone here. Um, and when you have a fracture, <clears throat> that's a break in the cortex of the bone that goes across in a horizontal fashion we call that a transverse fracture. If the fracture is gone at an angle, we'll call that an oblique. So as you can imagine, you might have one that's sort of slight angulation. Is that a transverse? Is that an oblique? It doesn't really matter too much. Um, you can call it in your report what you think it is. And if the clinician disagrees, then they can disagree. It's not really going to affect the management. It's more that if you see an obvious transverse, um, just say transverse. If it's quite angulated like this, uh, if the fracture line is angulated by that, I mean, um, then that is an oblique fracture. A spiral is where the oblique comes back around. So if you've got sort of one oblique and then you, it's followed by another one, this pattern, uh, then you can call that uh, a spiral pattern fracture. D is commonly seen in pediatrics. So we've got um, what's called a green stick fracture, where you've got uh, a slight bowing uh, of the bone. H is bowing, actually. That's just bowing without, without sort of the actual mark of a fracture. But <laughs> this is sort of also called a plastic deformity and it occurs in uh, young bones, so pediatrics, uh, at a point of the bowing on sort of the, I'd say, larger surface or the outer surface, if we call it inner here, uh, you can get a little fracture there. Um, you can call that a green stick fracture. E is a buckle. So you have a, your bone here. You get a little protrusion up there and the fracture goes along the protrusion. That's called a buckle, aka a torus. You can also call that. Again, you don't need to learn all of these, so don't worry. It's just if you do see these terms, uh, it's good to know sort of what they are. And again, I will send out these slides so you can you can go back through them. But uh, tomorrow, when I show you some cases, um, they won't be some of the more complicated ones. But you, you may be able to sort of say transverse or oblique or or something else like that. So this is a butterfly also called a wedge. As you can see, it's sort of a wedge taken out of the bone like that. Um, this one now, this one is uh, pathological. So remember when I was saying about the history in, in terms of uh, knowing sort of the history of the patient, because if you have uh, abnormal bone, um, for example, osteoporosis, or let's say the patient's got a malignancy, you can get something called a pathological fracture which means that it's a fracture through abnormal bone. So you're going to see an unusual pattern here of some flakes, um, something that you might not get if you just have a simple transverse fracture in an otherwise previously healthy bone. Uh, H, I've already uh, described as bowing. Now this one uh, in I, we've got an avulsion fracture uh, where you get a little bit of bone uh, that's pulled off. So here, for example, the bone might be as attachment site of a tendon. Uh, 
which is which a tendon is basically a mus a muscle attaching to a bone. You can get a ligament as well, which is a bone attaching to a bone. Um, but sometimes I'd say more often it will be a muscle uh, that attaches to a tendon. The tendon gets broken and it will pull off a little bit of a bone, and that's called an avulsion. We see that quite commonly, uh, so that's good to know about. How do you distinguish pathological from healthy transverse without a DEXA scan? That's the question I've got through. Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, now, that's a good point because on plain film, uh, we don't typically tend to comment on the actual makeup of the bone. Now, by that, I mean that as you said, a DEXA scan is the best scan to look for how healthy the bone is or not, or osteoporotic. What we can say is, um, we can say that if the bone is obviously very, very lucent, and by lucent, I mean it looks blacker than normal. In radiology, we can say that the bone is very osteopenic. And by that, I mean that it just looks very black. So if we say this bone looks very osteopenic, has the patient had a DEXA scan? Or we can say the bones look very osteopenic, recommend DEXA scan. This fracture uh, could be pathological, but you can't say for definite. Uh, in a healthy transverse, the bone will just look a lot whiter, a lot sort of more normal. Um, but sometimes it is hard to tell between the two. So that's a very good question. And you don't have to label it as a pathological fracture. Uh, if it's very obvious, you can, you can see metastases on the film or you can see someone with a very sort of blackened, by blackened, blackened I mean lucent bone, then you know that something's wrong. But we tend to not comment too much because it can, unless it's obvious, it can be hard to distinguish from plain film is not the, not sort of the best test for that. J is intraarticular. Uh, that is something that is uh, sort of very uh, useful to know about. Um, and by that, I mean that uh, it's good to comment on whether it affects the joint. So by intraarticular, uh, I mean that it goes into the uh, joint. So as you can see here, the fracture is going all the way into there. So that's in the joint and you can get some then reaction around here and some swelling. Uh, so often I'll say, uh, if this is the femur, there is a uh, distal femoral oblique fracture that extends intraarticularly, inferiorly, or something like that, uh, because that can uh, determine management as well, uh, different management if it's intraarticular or extraarticular. Uh, so... Let's go on to the next ones. Uh, I've got a question that says, what if the fracture can't be classified? Um, that's absolutely fine. The, the, these, as I said, these don't, you don't need to classify them all the time. You can just describe, they don't, they won't all fit into a, a, a simple sort of a category. So if you just describe it, I can, for example, I can see a, a lucent, which is, means black, or a sclerotic, which is more white line in the distal femur. Uh, it has associated periosteal reaction or it is intraarticular. Um, it, this is suspicious for an acute fracture. You don't have to classify it every time. So that's a great question. Um, would you state origin and end of a fracture line using anatomical positions? Um, yes, the, not necessarily the origin and the end of the line, but, uh, you would say the position. So for example, if there was a, let's say that, uh, this is the femur and there's a fracture here, there is a transverse fracture of the distal femur. Uh, you don't sort of need to say it starts from the you don't have to say it starts from the distal and ends to the distal. There's just a fraction, a fracture in the distal femur. If there was a fracture all the way sort of uh, in the proximal part, you can say 
the fracture starts in the proximal aspect of the left femur and extends into all the way down the femur to the uh, distal third or something like that. A good question as well. So we'll do the Salter quickly because these is this is a little bit more advanced. This is basically pediatric fractures. Um, I don't expect you to to learn this, but maybe for some of you in the older years, the main point I want you to recognize is that when you see films that have uh, specific kind of breaks in the bone, uh, what looks like a fracture actually is called a physis. Now this is a growth plate in children or sort of even teenagers, anyone up to the age of 18 or even slightly older will have these uh, growth plates here, which means that the, bone is, the bones are still growing. So they've got a physis, a growth plate. The bones haven't fused yet, especially the long bones. So be careful about calling those fractures in, in, uh, in young people uh, because their bones haven't fused. Um, you don't need to learn the Salter criteria. Uh, that's called a Salter Harris criteria, which is a criteria for uh, naming the different types of, of pediatric fractures in growth plates. But the reason why I just put it in is just so that you can see the different parts of the bone. So the physis is the growth plate. <clears throat> the epiphysis is typically the head of the bone. The metaphysis is the neck. And then the diaphysis is sort of the shaft or the long part of the bone. So diaphysis uh, is sometimes called shaft. This is just the long part of the bone. Goes into the neck, which is called the metaphysis. Then you've got the physis, which is the growth plate. And then you've got the epiphysis, which is the head of the bone. And here is the articular surface. This would be the joint. Um, this will show up as radiolucent, this will be black. So when I say radiolucent, I mean it's typically going to be black. Um, sclerotic or radiodense mean it's going to be more white on the film. We'll go through that tomorrow uh, when we actually see the cases, but I'll show you the bones in a second on the when we do some anatomy. So you don't need to sort of know these, but this is just for your interest if you want to. Um, a Salter one is you cannot see the fracture that clearly on the film. Number two, Salter two would be above a fracture above the growth plate. Salter Harris three would be low, uh, below the growth plate. The way to remember it is uh, the second one is the second letter. So A above. Third letter is L, which is low. That's how I remember it. The fourth letter is T, which is through. So this has gone all the way through. This is the worst prognosis and actually needs to be managed more sort of surgically more often. So that's sort of a worse fracture. And five, we use the uh, R. We don't really have the E in the mnemonic, but when you sort of get into foundation and beyond, you might need to learn this Salter Harris criteria, or you may need it in med school, actually. Uh, I'm not sure what exams you'll have, but... Uh, the, the four and five are the sort of more serious injuries. Uh, rammed, you can also call crushed. So it can be torn uh, or ruined, more likely, uh, or rammed, where you get it crushed. And you can see the physis hair has been lost um, because it's sort of been pushed into each other. So that's just a little bit about pediatrics. Main thing to remember is that they have a physis or a growth plate. So if they're a young patient, you can say, I have a radiograph of a skeletally immature patient. So don't call it fracture. Just remember that it's a, uh, a radiograph of a child if you see those growth plates, especially if you see them bilaterally. So if they're on both sides, it's unlikely they would have done the same exact injury to both sides. Last few, and then we will get on with the anatomy. So... Just a couple of points. Um, the, the, the orthopedics uh, colleagues like these a bit more, but in terms of, uh, you'll hear these terms, angulation. Uh, angulation, really, if you, if you do remember one thing about sort of this slide, it is that describe the distal portion. 
if you say that there is a transverse uh, fracture of the uh, femur with dorsal angulation. Uh, dorsal uh, means it's going towards sort of the, uh, well, it will be the posterior side if you're in the anatomical position, but don't worry too much about that. Hopefully you've come across the term sort of dorsal and volar. Uh, volar means palmar uh, typically, so it would be this side and dorsum would be this side. So if I talk about uh, angulation, it will be the distal portion. So if it's dorsally angulated, remember that we're talking about the distal fragment will be dorsally angulated. So well, there is volar angulation that would be always describing the distal. Again, with displacement, if there is dorsal displacement or medial displacement, remember in the anatomical position where you're standing, if the fracture has gone medially like this, the distal portion uh, would be how you describe the displacement. Uh, I've just got a question that says, uh, would a callus at physis slow the growth? It's a good question. Yes, it can do. A callus re really just means that sort of it's a bone, the bone healing itself. Um, it can slow down the growth in some patients, but uh, not always. So it's a good question. It just depends on the patient, depends on the age. Sometimes it can, sometimes it won't slow down the growth, but especially if you have a Salter Harris four or five, which were the more serious ones where it's gone through the joint, straight through the physis, or it's gone uh, the rammed or the crushed injury, then that would slow the growth for sure, or not only slow the growth, but produce abnormal growth and would have to be fixed. Um, the last one we've got are subluxation and dislocation. So if you have dislocation, the whole portion of one fragment of the bone has to be not located anymore with the other side. So total disruption of the joint surface, whereas subluxation, there is still some part of the joint that is connected or end located. So Remember, if you say dislocation, it needs to have been fully taken off from the joint. If it's just been slightly moved, okay, but it's still connecting to some part, it's a subluxation instead. So we'll just, uh, in the last sort of 20 minutes, do some of the uh, anatomy. We'll just ask, I'll open it up sort of a couple of questions on each slide of the anatomy, and then I will... Uh, just go through a little uh, few more bits of the anatomy as well. It can get quite complicated, but it's better to just focus on the sort of easier parts and be comfortable with what the main bones are and uh, the also sort of the joints, um, which bones connect with each other and where. So we'll just go through that now. Um, it's important to just know sort of the basic anatomy. Uh, so for tomorrow, when we do cases, we can just describe the fractures, maybe using a couple of the terms that we've had just now um, with the correct location, if you can, that would be fantastic. So we've got a shoulder radiograph here. Uh, I haven't got the label of the side, but it's probably a uh, right shoulder. Normally they would give you the front frontal view. So when I say frontal, I just mean that I'm looking at it face on. Uh, so we've got the shoulder joint here. Now, would anyone be able to tell me in the chat what I'm pointing at sort of here? Uh, just have a sort of a type if you want to type something. The, you give me a couple of answers. Got a couple of answers coming through. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Humerus is good. And head of the humerus uh, for the full marks there. So uh, the humeral head, excellent. I'm getting lots of answers come through. So humeral head. So it is part of the humerus, uh, but specifically sort of um, the humeral head. So uh, 
I'll just get my arrow up. So the humeral head comes around here. Then you've got, we're going to have the humeral neck here. This is sometimes called the surgical neck, the humerus, and the anatomical neck would be just a little bit higher up here. So you can have the anatomical neck fracture through the anatomical neck there, or the surgical neck, which will just be below it. Then you've got the humeral head. Now the humeral head is connected to this part of the uh, scapula. Does anyone know what the humeral head uh, sits in? Excellent, great. I've got all, a lot of good answers there. It's the glenoid fossa. So the humeral head, uh, glenoid labrum, yeah, glenoid, glenoid fossa, glenoid of scapula. So we've got the glenoid here. Um, if there's a dislocation, the glenohumeral joint is disrupted. And uh, if it's intact, I might say no acute fracture seen and the glenohumeral joint is intact. Now there's another joint in the shoulder that's up here. These two parts of bones here. I'm going to point at this structure now. If someone can tell me which bone uh, I'm pointing at there. Excellent. Yeah, that's the clavicle. So that's the distal uh, portion of the clavicle. Uh, and I've got an answer just now, but if anyone else wants to type in what the clavicle uh, is sort of a joint to just here. The clavicle is in a joint with this. What is this part of this gap here? Uh, yeah, excellent. I'm getting the answers come through. It's the acromion. So you've got the acromioclavicular joint. So you've got humeral head, humeral neck, glenoid fossa or glenoid, clavicle, and you've got the acromion and then acromioclavicular joint. So if we can't see the fracture on this film, uh, then you've got sort of all the ribs here. You've got the lung field. You can see a little bit of the spine. So on this, on this radiograph, uh, obviously we would check the other view, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, but we might say no acute fracture seen. The glenohumeral and acromioclavicular joints are intact or are congruent which means that they're in joint. So that's excellent. So tomorrow I might show you, uh, I will show you a shoulder and we'll see if we can see a fracture on there. These slides will go out, but I've got, uh, I've got some, some labels on for you when you get the slides to just have a look at some of the uh, other labels. Um, this is just a, another sort of view of the shoulder. Um, it's a little bit more zoomed in. Um, I can see a little bit more of the humeral neck heading down into the diaphysis, but I've got diaphysis coming up or shaft of the humerus. I've got humeral neck, uh, surgical neck, anatomical neck, humeral head in the glenoid, and then we've got a chromioclavicular joint up there. Now, uh, I'll let you guys have a look at that later because that is uh, just seems similar to the last picture. This is another view of the shoulder because you often, as I said, you need to have two views. You often get this view, which is called the Y view. Um, it's not the most common orthogonal view. So when I said we need two views, you have an orthogonal view, which means that it's uh, sort of 90 degrees or has to be lateral to the other view. You have the frontal view. Uh, more commonly, we get an axial or a view where you look from above, looking down to the shoulder, or you can look through the shoulder sort of on the lateral side, and they call it the Y view because of the shape of the scapula. So that's just to uh, show you basically that uh, uh, you have another view so you can spot any fractures that might not have been seen on the other view. So that's just the scapula sort of from the side, humeral head. Uh, and you can see the acromioclavicular joint up there. Uh, another good little bony landmark, if you've heard of it before, is the coracoid process of the scapula. 
uh, the coracoid process is a very important sort of bony reference point because the coracoid process always sits anterior. So I'll show you uh, a case tomorrow, but uh, basically if we have got a dislocation of the glenohumeral joint, the coracoid process uh, can show you uh, which part is anterior. If you're looking at a funny view, the coracoid process always sits anterior. If you can't work out where's anterior and posterior, um, look for the coracoid process and that will tell you it's anterior. If you've got your humerus that's moved towards the coracoid process, it's moved anteriorly, or if it's moved away from the coracoid process of the scapula, you have a posterior dislocation. Um, I've got a question about the Y view. The Y view is just, if they shot the uh, X-ray straight through the lateral, the shoulder here. So they've just shot it through in the Y view. It's just a view, it's a plane that's kind of in, imagine like a sagittal, if you know what the sagittal mean. It just, instead of shooting through the front, it's just looking through the side where you get to see the uh, scapula in what looks like a Y plane. So it's just lateral. Um, I'll just ask you a couple of questions about the elbow, uh, which is another sort of uh, very common request that you're going to get to see. Um, so what bone have we got here? Hopefully most of you will know what we've got there. Just write in the chat if you want to write your answer in the chat. Yeah, we've got the humerus again. So the humerus is going to connect with a bone in the forearm. So does everyone know what this bone is that it's gonna connect with? Yeah, distal humerus was for the last one. Distal is good to say. Ulna, yeah, connects with the ulna. And then next to the ulna here, we've got the radius. Fantastic, that's great. So if I'm gonna be more specific about the radius, which part of the radius am I outlining here? Radial head, fantastic. Radial head fracture will be a line seen here that's very, very commonly seen. Uh, so a fracture of the head of the radius you need to look out for. You've got the radial neck, ulna, we've got humerus, uh, we've got medial epicondyle of the humerus. How do I know that's medial? Well, because the bony part of the uh, of the humerus, you can actually feel on your own sort of arm. You can feel that bony protuberance. That's how you know it's medial. And then radial will sit on the excellent. I've got trochlea and cap capitellum. So yes. Uh, the trochlea and the capitulum are specific uh, terms for the parts of the humerus. So uh, well done, Namratha. Uh, you've got uh, radius connects with the capitulum, and you've got the ulna that connects with the trochlea. So that's a little bit more of detailed anatomy. Uh, what else have we got here? Olecranon fossa. That's the olecranon fossa in there. Let's see if we've got some labels on there. Olecranon fossa. Uh, coronoid process. There's that, that's sort of a little bit more detailed, um, but it's just so long as you recognize sort of that the ulna is the one that connects with the humerus. Then you've got the radial head here, radial neck, very common site of fractures. You can get fractures in the medial and lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Yeah, lateral and medial epicondyle. The trochlea um, and the uh, capitellum are just below the medial and lateral lateral condyle, if that makes sense. You've got medial sort of epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, and then the trochlea and capitellum sometimes can be interchangeable with the condyle. So if that's your specific question, you've got epicondyle, epicondyle, and then condyles which can sometimes be interchangeably used with trochlea and capitellum. It can get confusing because some centers want you to use lateral and medial condyle and epicondyles, and then some want you to use capitellum and trochlea. Um, I've got a question that does the radial tuberosity 
overlap the ulna. Yes, uh, it does. This is the radial tuberosity. Um, and you can just see it sort of projected over it. Um, it does just slightly overlap, but it depends on when you, it can overlap, but it depends on how you're sort of moving your, your arm because you can, you can make it look how it wants to really. It depends on the angle if they've got it straight, but yes, that's what you're seeing projected um, sort of there in that image. Uh, and we'll look at a case tomorrow. Um, a specific view for the elbow joint. Yeah, this is a specific view. You just have a sort of a frontal view where you've taken the image like that, the x-ray, and the other specific view will be this lateral. There won't be another choice. Like the shoulder, you have a couple of options, uh, whether to look from the above or the side with the elbow. You just look from the front. We take one and then we do one from the side. This is the lateral. Uh, you've got the ulna coming here. That's uh, basically joined to the humerus, and then the radius sits here. Uh, a little tip for looking at fractures is something called fat pads. I wouldn't get you to worry too much about this, but uh, in radiology, we look for fat pads because if we can see fluid around these fat pads, uh, then we're more suspicious for a fracture occurring. So you don't normally see these fat pads very well, but if they're quite prominent, it suggests that there's some inflammation. And then we'll go hunting a little bit further for a, uh, for a fracture. So what is this little part of the bone called that I've got my cursor on? Oh, I'll just get my cursor back. Does anyone know what that is? Anyone want to write in the chat? Radial tuberosity, yeah. That's the radial tuberosity. Just that little notch there. Very good. Well done. I'll let you look at those slides later on. Uh, so we will just quickly go through the other ones. I'll let you guys look at these slides at home. The wrist bones are quite complicated. Um, you probably will have to learn them at some point, uh, but you've got the radius coming in here. Uh, remember the radius, radial head was at the elbow, but the uh, distal part of the radius is wider than the distal part of the ulna. This is the ulna styloid process, radial styloid process. Uh, you can get fractures to the distal radius, distal ulna very commonly. Does anyone know what this bone is that I'm pointing at there? Absolutely, scaphoid. Yeah, that's great. You've got a scaphoid here that uh, can commonly get injured and it's sometimes difficult to see on x-ray. So we may have to actually image it uh, 10 days to 14 days later to see if there's a fracture of the scaphoid. But if you fall on your outstretched hand, uh, that's a very common place of injury. And you don't want to miss these because they can lead to something called an avascular necrosis, uh, which is quite a serious condition. So uh, how do you differentiate between the right and the left hand is a question. Uh, excellent question. You can't. You cannot differentiate uh, on this image, whether this is right or left. If I have it turned one way or the other way, I can't tell. So for example, uh, I have to sit in an anatomy exam soon, and uh, unless they give me a side, uh, they, if unless they say right or left in the top sort of part of the image at some point, you can't say, I just will have to say this is radius ulna. I can't say the right radius on just on the basis of this image. Uh, which side do you take from the, which side do you take the x-ray from, palma or dorsal? Um, it depends in different places. They do it differently. Normally you will just take it through and going through sort of the, uh, dorsal side, you put your hand like that flat, and then you'll take it. But if you're in too much pain or it's hard to do that, you can take it from the other side. Um, but it's easier to just put your hand, imagine putting your hand flat on the table and doing it through there, through the back. 
So you've got all these carpal bones that uh, you may have to learn at some point, but don't worry about them too much, if, especially if you're a one of the first years and early in your training. You've got scaphoid, uh, lunate. You've got sort of you've got uh, you've got scaphoid, lunate, triquetral. Uh, sort of lots of these different bones, trapezium, trapezium. So I won't, I won't sort of test you on some of those for now, but I'll put some of these up uh, so you can have a look at them. Uh, there's a mnemonic for remembering them. Um, there are different mnemonics to remember them, but any of these can get fractured, uh, especially scaphoid, I'd say is the most important. Capitate does get fractured quite commonly as well. Um, and also... Uh, the hook of the hamate, which is uh, this is this is hamate, and the hook can get fractured quite commonly as well. Translucency of the pisiform help orientate. Um, could the translucency of the pisiform help orientate? Yes, it could. It could help you orientate. But if you mean orientating on which, uh, if you if you mean orientating right or left, you can't orientate that. But if you mean orientate on which side you're looking for, it's best to if if you mean sort of radial or ulnar side, the radius will always be the wider one, and the scaphoid will be on this radial side. Uh, in terms of orientating whether you're radial or ulnar side, but uh, you can't orientate uh, right or left, unfortunately. Um, this was just to show you sort of finger x-ray. Uh, you can uh, commonly get fractures here. You've got the uh, metacarpal bone here, and then you've got the phalanges, phalanges. So you've got the proximal, middle, and distal phalanx or phalanges uh, in a plural, and any of these bones can get uh, fractured. So I'll let you guys look at the slides later on. You can also get dislocations, obviously, uh, any of those joints. So just quickly, we'll just go over the hip uh, and ankle, and then we'll wrap up and do some questions. But I will show you these sort of cases tomorrow. And uh, we've got uh, about 10 cases, and we can go through some of the fractures. But it's useful to know the anatomy before we start that. So. Let's start with uh, this bone here. Can everyone tell me what bone this is? Yeah, it's the femur, uh, the proximal femur. I haven't put a side on. Um, it's fine if you assume that it's the right side because normally in radiology, we will get given this as the right side. You've got the, uh, the femur here. Uh, does anyone know what specific part of the femur uh, that is where the mouse is on now? I've got some answers coming in. Yeah, excellent. You've got the greater trochanter. Uh, so you can get fractures at the greater trochanter. You can get fractures here at the lesser trochanter. You can get an intertrochanteric fracture. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed up because it is seven. So I'll just quickly just finish this off intratrochanteric fracture you can get a fracture here obviously in the neck of the femur or call it subcapital and you've got the femoral head here uh, then you've got the iliac bones uh, the pubic symphysis and these are called the superior and inferior pubic rami any of these can get fractured very common to get fractures probably as you know as you know here in the neck of the femur uh, you can get fractures sort of in the proximal femur quite commonly, fractures through the, through the uh, inferior superior pubic rami, and you can also get fractures, obviously, of the spine sacrum around here. So I'll let you look at those later. Um, I won't get you guys, I won't test you on this because we've run out of time, but uh, we'll look at a couple of knees, knees tomorrow. Um, obviously, you've got the femur. You can see the patella there. You can see the tibia here and the tibial plateau with the tibial spines. And this is the fibula, which is the much narrower bone compared to the tibia. Uh, 
any anywhere around here can get fractured you've just got to go through and look for those loosen as i said black lines sometimes sclerotic white lines or a step in the bony cortex but we'll go through how to what you're specifically looking for tomorrow um you just want to make sure that it's all smooth really and no step in any of the bones uh this is a lateral view of the knee i put this in because if you see a large effusion especially supra patella effusion you can be very suspicious that it is possibly a fracture, uh, especially if there's blood um, and blood will be more dense, sort of a more dense effusion. So look out for the effusion with the knee as well as tracing around the bones. Um, and the last one is the ankle and foot. Uh, so as you can see here, we've got the uh, distal tibia and then that's next to the distal fibula. You've got the talus there. You can't really see the rest of the bones here, but you really want to make sure that there's a nice smooth sort of space between the talus and the uh, tibia there, because um, if that is disrupted, you'd be suspicious for a dislocation or fracture dislocation as well. You can also call this the medial malleolus, and that can be called the lateral malleolus on the fibula there. Um, you can look through these slides later and look through, through some of the other uh, arrows as well. This is just the lateral view. You always need to have a lateral view. So now we've got the calcaneus at the back. You can see the talus. Uh, the calcaneus uh, is sort of joined onto the cuboid bone. You've got the navicular bone here. I'll let you guys look through this. And you've got some cuneiforms as well. Any of these can get fractured. You can also get some uh, coalitions of these bones, which are called sort of, for example, a calcaneo navicular coalition, if you see them conjoined like that. So look out for those, and sometimes you'll see those in films, and you can comment on them. If you want to, you don't have to. But always need a lateral view with your uh, images too. Uh, I think this is, must be the last slide, just to show you the bones of the feet. Uh, remember, if when we had the metacarpals, in the hand, they're analogous to these uh, metatarsal bones, which are connected to the phalanges of the toes. Um, any of these obviously can get fractured as well as these little bones, which are called sesamoid bones because they're within tendons. Don't let those put you off. Those are sort of normal bones. They're called sesamoid bones and they can get fractured as well. And uh, you can have a look through some of those labels if you want and test yourselves. Uh, if, if it helps you to learn them.